Black History Media Podcast. Welcome to Black History Mini Docs podcast, an extension of our BHMD social media website, where under two minutes, you can immerse yourself in Black history with factual, accurate videos about historical events and Black people who have helped shape American history. I am Bonita Brisker, affectionately known as Busy B, actress, singer, writer, director, producer, and co-founder of AgriSmart, Inc. Today is a very special broadcast, and I know I always say that today is a very special broadcast because it is, and they always have been. Each one has its own unique specialness that makes it all better for the collective. So here we go again. But first, let me take a quick moment to thank the curator and the executive producer of BHMD, our very own Nima Barnett, award-winning television film director and producer, and her husband, Reed R. McCants, also an award-winning actor, director, producer, who created BHMD. Thank you, Nima and Reed, paying homage to a dynamic duo for producing hundreds of episodes of Black History Mini Docs and edutaining our youth and reminding us all, young and old, me old, (laughs) of our great legacy and the contributions that African Americans have made throughout history. I am just so fortunate to be able to interview people that I admire and I adore today. Our very special guest is a scholar, Professor Emerita Vera J. Katz. Vera Katz is a legendary acting and directing professor, having taught both acting and theater at Howard University for over 32 years. For over 60 years, Professor Katz has been a prominent voice in the world of arts and entertainment. Her groundbreaking techniques have worked to shape the careers of many of today's brightest stars, from Broadway to Hollywood. To name a few from an esteemed list, Debbie Allen, Felicia Rashad, Lynn Whitfield, Isaiah Washington, Anthony Anderson, Taraji P. Henson, and the beloved Chadwick Boseman, who's gone but not forgotten. The list goes on for the many lives she's touched and changed in their respective fields. Vera's teachings have literally crossed borders. She's taught numerous master classes and workshops, both nationally and internationally, too many to list. She resides in the nation's capital and has taught over 20 years at the Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Also, the Woolly Mammoth Theater Company, the African Continuum Theater Coalition, and she still teaches a master class workshop, coaching actors for performances at the upcoming National Black Theater Festival in Winston-Salem. Vera still prepares actors for auditions and performances on camera. It is an honor and a privilege to present Professor Vera J. Katz. Vera, 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 my heart is so full. I am still wound up from attending your 86th birthday bash and your book launch party at Howard University just last week. Congratulations, Vera. You are amazing. Vera, how was it seeing all of your former students who came from near and far to honor you? I was so proud, Vanita, to see what they're doing. And even the ones who aren't doing theater, they're doing something with what they learned at Howard. They're leading groups. They founded companies. They're, in their business endeavors, they told me they're using their directing skills. Um, I was so happy to see where they've grown to. And it meant a lot to me. Uh, many of them came from different states. And um, it was such a wonderful reunion to see them and to feel that they're out there in the world and they're making a contribution and uh, they're giving back, and they're affecting younger people. Um, Brian Chandler told me, and I taught him in the 70s, that he started teaching at Ohio University. And um, I was so excited about that because I've always wanted him to do something in theater. And his acting career just got stalled. 
But the next thing I knew, he asked me, called me on the phone out of the blue and said, would I write a recommendation letter for him? And I did. And he told me he's at Ohio State now. And I'm so thrilled with that kind of progress. That's amazing. There were many, many honors given to you by your former students. It was a wonderful event. Uh, Lynn Whitfield was yes. there and she said some wonderful things about you. You were literally verified <laughs> with <laughs> proclamations, dedications. You were inducted with an honorary ghetto pass to say it like you mean it because your <laughs> students said it, which you always do. I know you for that. Yeah. You speak the truth no matter where you are, how it is, how it sounds. You're going to tell the truth. Well, if you don't, then people are not going to trust you when you say the work was good. Then they're going to say, well, she just says that all the time, but she doesn't. We don't know what that. You need to get people to believe you. You know, in, in this business, uh, art slash uh, business, um, sometimes there isn't enough honesty. And the very least a good teacher can do is give honesty. So um, if I say the work was good, then I really mean it, and they know that I really mean it. If I say the work was good, but you might do this or you might do that, they know where I'm coming from. So that's important. You have to be honest. Not brutal, but honest. Well, I guess brutal is a matter of perspective. <laughs> <laughs> We're so sensitive, <laughs> yes, yes. but it's 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 good. And you you've never been brutal, but you know you could say, as you've said to me, don't use cheap tricks like letting the phone ring all the time. Yeah. And and th th at the moment, because my show opened up with the telephone ringing, <laughs> it was it brutal. You. Yeah, it you. <laughs> but it was very one. I I I changed the 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 yes. opening of the show, and it made it stronger. Yeah. So it's really important to right. to tell the truth. And we're we, talking about you playing Billie Holiday, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, that was quite wonderful. You were quite wonderful in that. And we did it at the National Black Theater we, uh, we Festival. We did it twice. We and did, where else did we do it? We did it at the Public Theater in, in Chevrolet, Maryland, yes, here in Washington, D.C. Yes, yes, And yes. you were wonderful. Oh, yes. my goodness. I I grew as an actor. You know, it, it was so incredible to come. You know, I was just speaking of our um, curators, the creator of BHMD, and they're such a dynamic duo. Yeah. And when I met you and your husband, Tom, yeah. Yeah. who was um, just an incredible virtuoso on the piano right. and um, music director there at Howard University, right. um, when I came to study with you for the first time and I had the privilege of working with Tom, yeah. I remember going from one room with you, mm -hmm. getting all of those nuggets and lessons and, mm -hmm. and getting, you know, really worked out strongly. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the back room mm -hmm. where Tom worked me out musically. And it was an experience that I had never had in mm -hmm. my career. You know, people always ask me, um, what, what do I do when I work with black actors? The thing is, I see your talent and I see your beauty and that's true of all the other people I've worked with. And when I see talent, it's it's just very exciting. And it's a nugget. And, you know, the, the person itself doesn't quite know whether they have it or not. But they hope they do when they believe in themselves. And so what I try to do is pull it out of you. So whether you're black or whether you're white, I just pull out your talent and try to give you the technique to make it shine. And that's what I want to do. I want the talent and the beauty inside of, of whomever I'm working with to come out. Uh, now, if I don't see the talent, then, you know, I don't work that way. I don't work that hard, and I'm not that excited, and, and I'm not turned on, as they say. So I saw the talent in you, and I saw the, the inner depth in you, and so I was so interested in pulling it out of you. I don't work on things that I don't believe in. That was my next question, because that's really important when someone comes to you um, to work on a project, uh, something that you may not be very passionate about. And if you think in your mind, this is going to be longer than I expected. Mm -hmm. Do you, what's the alternative? 
Well, I, I, I used to slosh through. I don't do that anymore. Well, you know, because of my age, I don't have the, the patience that doesn't interest me. Um, I work with students uh, since, of course, COVID on Zoom. And um, I was working with a young lady who has a, a lead in, and I was trying to teach her beats and how each, each time you change the subject, you change your energy and you change your uh, pace and you change your volume. She said, this is a lot of hard work. Now, she was a lead in this show. This is a lot of hard work. And I said, well, yes, it is, if you want to be a working actress that lasts, that lasts. And she said, oh, oh. And I said, well, maybe you want to think about this. And she said, yes, I do. And so I said, all right, good luck to you. So I went and watched the show after that. And she was a girlfriend on the show and a lead. Very pretty. Beautiful makeup application. Lovely teeny little waist. But her acting was terrible. And I was glad I was out of it. And she didn't want it. It's amazing. That's a great story. Now, she won't last. She'll be the flavor of the moment. And there are so many like that who, you know, think that their size two waist and their prettiness will carry them through to uh, where Felicia Rashad is in her, at her age, and I won't mention it. But she's managed to go through decades and decades. Yes. Uh, and and many other fine actresses, because Meryl of the Streep, hard work. decades and decades, and it's really about training. What gets me, Benita, is that lay people and often actors don't think that they need training, but to be a dancer you need training, and to play the piano you need training, and. Why not for acting? Just because they think, well, I can read and I can talk? Well, that's not what acting is. It's more than that. So anyway, that I digress good, uh, I here. love that. That's, that. that's so powerful. A good actor makes it appear that it's easy to yeah. do. Yes. And it's a lot of hard work yes. involved. A lot of training. Yes. Long hours. Yes. Of many an analysis different techniques. Of, and understanding people and understanding character. People come to me and say, well, well, just teach me how to memorize quickly. They think it's to memorize. And I, I say to them all the time, don't memorize until you understand where it's coming yes. from. Don't memorize immediately because then you'll be saying it like it's memorized. And I hear people on TV and they sound like, They've, they're reading the lines from the script. There's no humanity in it. And when people of color do that, I get more upset. Now, why do I get more upset? Well, because I'm going to digress for a minute. In my lifetime, and I'm in my 80th decade, I've never personally met a person of Asian descent on a personal level. Really? I've seen them on TV. Yes. I've seen them in film, but I, I've seen them in the restaurants, mm -hmm. wonderful food, but I've never interacted with one. So where do I get my impressions from? Where do I get my understanding of who they are? From film, from television, from reading a book. From observations right. in, in, in right. passing in the right. restaurants, wherever you, you right. have to do the research. Right. And recently in the elevator in my new place after my husband passed, I met Jason Wong and I said, thank you, God. And we have a friendship through a little dog, which is how things happen. But my point is that why am I upset when people of color are not doing the work and out there, they are sending an impression to multitudes of people 
who don't know them. And one has to not only, they don't know them, but you have to counteract the media. You have to counteract the politics. You have to counteract all the films that have come before in the 50s, 60s. It hasn't been that long in the 70s. Let me, let me stop you here because, and I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. that, but that's so powerful. And it brings me to the question that I really want to ask you. And, and while you're, please don't forget where you are because you're yeah. answering it and it's yeah. an important question. So I want to make sure that we get the full scope of this right. because I, I wanted to talk about your accomplishments, but you're right there on it. I read somewhere I may have even heard you say this, that one of your greatest accomplishments is touching lives, mostly impacting the lives of African-Americans by insisting that we understand the value of our own story. I mean, wow, now that's a broad statement, but explain now, because you were just on the track of this. What do you mean by this? Why is it so important to you as a Jewish woman to impart this virtue on our culture? Well, as I've said, this is how the, the larger country gets to know you. That means that you are the carrier of your history and your legends and, and your stories and your contributions to this country. And you have to carry it in a way that you're a teacher in your own way, that instructs others as to who you are. Uh, just at this event that you said that you loved, I invited two of my cousins. I don't have a large family. And I invite, most of them are gone. And I invited two of my cousins, and they were outside. And my cousin called me the next day, and she said, I had such a good time. She, did, she didn't go to the event. She just... Did the outside. Oh, the pre the pre event outdoors, yes. the reception. And I said, Oh, I'm so glad. And then she kept saying over and over, Everybody was so nice. <laughs> Everybody was so friendly. Everybody was so warm. <laughs> and I finally said, Well, what how what did you think they would be? <laughs> And she said, well, I, I just mean, I felt so comfortable. I felt so. And she meant that. And it was a wonderful, uh, you know. And then she said, I want to contribute. How can I contribute? So it, it brought her to even wanting to contribute. The so point I'm making is yeah. that was her first connection in not just the tube or the screen or a book or a, an article in the Washington Post, but real life black people chatted with her and she loved it. And she said, and then she said, this, this shows the ignorance. I have a phrase in my book called the limitations of being white. I wanted to call the book that, but I was dissuaded. And, you know, because then it sounded like a political treaty. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but the limitations of being white, she said, and they're all such beautifully different colors. And I said, well, think about that. Why do you think that is? <laughs> the <laughs> ignorance and the limitation of being white. And she meant well. Yeah, She's yeah. a very warm, you know, fuzzy person uh, who hasn't really thought about topics that my life has been steeped in and your life has yes. been because you've lived it. Yes. So... She said, oh, oh, yes. Oh, Vera, I always learn something from you. And I thought, my goodness, you know, how come you didn't learn that earlier elsewhere? Well, so when they look at the tube and they look at, and this is my business, getting people who prepared for a job on screen or on stage. When I took my grandson years ago to see a production of Raisin in the Sun at Arena Stage, and he was in high school senior. And we walked back to the car after. And I said, well, you told me you saw the movie when we came. What did you think of the play? And he said, oh, they were real people up there. I, I could feel their, their presence and their breath. I saw real people. That's amazing. That's beautiful. He said, that was so much better, Grandma. And he was in high school. Beautiful. And so... 
that's what my cousin experienced. I think it's so amazing that you have been designated, it, 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 chosen, or, or it, it's a choice you made. I heard, so, so here's a two-part question to what you just explained to us, um, why it's important to introduce your culture and tell your stories, your own stories, because you are reaching the, the masses of people to understand who you are and bringing people together. Yeah. And and I heard Lynn Whitfield say uh, the other night, uh, and I'm sure you've heard it time and time again, as a professor at an HBCU, when someone comes to you and and asks you, how can you tell me about how to be who I am, how to be, mm -hmm. you know, me and my culture? Mm -hmm. How do you answer that? Well, I'll give you a little story. Um, I was doing a workshop and a young, talented man. Uh, I said, who has a monologue they'd like to do? And a young, talented man who I didn't know got up and he did a monologue. And it started with, I'm proud to be black. And he said it with anger. I'm proud to be black. And then he went on, I like being black. And he talked about why he liked being black with intensity that was verging on hostility. Now, I know why that was happening. But when he got through, I said, are you really proud to be black? He said, yes. I said, well, what do you like about it? He said, well, I just told you. I said, no, you didn't tell me. You told me that you were angry that other people didn't like you. That's what I heard. Now, could we go back and start with some love and tell me how much you love your people? Now, is that telling him how to be black or is that just pulling out technique from him where is the love in the peace yes and intensity is not angry i always believe that our culture share similarities in so many ways M most noted where our cultures uh had nothing in common with certain groups of other americans and we felt the sting of that by by means of segregation and discrimination and the effects of it on our Mm -hmm. cultures, you know, mm -hmm. independently, mm -hmm. which gives us our common ground to stand on with our relationships. Mm -hmm. We've always had very deep conversations about our yes. communities and, and, and mm -hmm. always beautiful conversations because American Jews played a significant role in, in, in our lives, in the founding and funding of our most important organizations, mm -hmm. including the NAACP in 1909, and other civil rights leaders to found the mm -hmm. NAACP. And I learned this mm -hmm. when I wrote my one woman show titled Benita and Billy, which you just mentioned, because you dramaturged and directed it in the um, public theater in Cheverly mm -hmm. and in North Carolina and the Black um, Theater, theater Festival, Festival yeah. uh, which was originally directed by the amazing Denise Douse. You also met mm -hmm. Denise Douse. We toured the show for years. But there are a couple of inferences to Jewish people in my show. Uh, Billy Holiday's most famous song, Strange Fruit, mm -hmm. was written by Abel Maripol, a Jewish songwriter yeah. and poet. Yeah. And we um, had such a, a, a wonderful time exploring these things. And I learned these incredible yeah. stories about um, the connection that we had, which mm -hmm. we literally made a personal connection and I'm so proud of. Um, but a, a lot of people, we get caught up in, in the crux of it because people fight over the Jewish culture, whether it's a faith-based religion or ethnic, or ethnic mm -hmm. you know trying to identify with our, our race and our mm -hmm. heritage. But I believe that those are the things that, um, because we've had those experiences together, you have been able to um, mm -hmm. come, you know, to us. Mm -hmm. and, and we just receive it so well. And we respect what you've taught us mm -hmm. because you've experienced so much of it yourself. Well, I respect what your people have done and and the journey and the strength and the determination. I've always respected that, even before I came to Howard. 
And I've always felt a connection. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about that the other night because my parents raised me that way. My, my, uh, parents had a lot of respect for black people. And when I was coming up, I was hearing things like that. And you read it in the book. Uh, dad was just uh, absolutely an aficionado of Duke Ellington. And he started wearing pocket handkerchiefs and fresh flowers. And he would go, they would go and see Duke Ellington. And everybody would say, well, why are you, what, why are you dressing that way? And he'd say, well, the Duke does it. So, and then I would hear these stories. So there was, you know, a respect for your culture and, uh, a, a connection to it. And, um, you know, America's done a job on both groups. This country, I don't have to tell you anybody that has not been kind to your people nor mine. And somehow we've survived a long period of time. We are even a smaller group than you are in the world, very small. And somehow we've managed to survive. And so we've had that inner determination and that inner strength. And I respect that your people have had it. And I always have. So there was that connection. And there was that understanding of how the hurt f- by receiving the disregard and the dislike uh, affects your psyche inside, as it does uh, people of color and as it does for Jewish people. We just handle it differently, but it does. So I understood that, you know, and so I was, I wanted you to, sh- be the best you could possibly be, the best that I saw you could be, the best that you were. And I just wanted to pull it out. Now, I I was well-trained. I had a lot of early experiences. The book will tell you about my Tante Lisa, who studied with Stanislavski uh, back in Russia. I, I, by virtue of where I came from, I had a lot to give. And I knew that if I gave it to you, you guys could run with it. And that was, I believe that all the time, that it would, it would take you somewhere. If people saw your inner beauty and understood who you were, then they'd love you the way I did. And so that was, that was what I had to do. And I believe that uh, I was put there to do that. I believe that um, coming to Howard was not something I got up and said, well, I'm going to apply to Howard. Yes, how did you end up? No, that was, that was one of those strange things that God brings you that uh, puts you on a path. You can either say, I don't want this path, or, or you don't pick it up, you know? But there are little... Silver Star is put in front of us, and we can either pick them up or not. Why did you pick it up? Well, I was on a panel. I was an adjudicator for a one-act place tournament in D.C. at Roosevelt High School. And there was this brilliant lady, and she was on the panel, and her name was Alfredine Brown. She was an actress, African-American, and she had done, been some, done some movies um, with Peter Ustinov, and, um, we gave critiques, and we both looked at each other and were impressed with each other in terms of the critiques and her intelligence, and she said, you should be teaching, and I said, well, that's what they told me at graduate school, but I do direct, and so I'm teaching, and she said, do you have a a higher degree? And I said, I have a master's. She said, why don't you go down and see my husband? He's chair of the department at Howard University, the theater department, and they're looking for someone. Now, I didn't know the backstory. The book tells me the the backstory. The backstory was it was late August. They needed someone to fill the bill. They had just run out another teacher who happened to be my color. I didn't know any of that. But they needed someone in August. 
So I went down, and he interviewed me, and he said uh, during the interview, well, um, and what do you know about our heritage? And I said, well, I've known many African Americans in my life, and I performed with someone in graduate school, and, uh, you know, I, I think I do. But as I said that, I said, you got a lot to learn, kid, as I was saying that. And he said, well, we'll give you a try, and, you know, here are the papers. And Well, I went home, Benita, and I started reading and reading. I read slave narratives. I read contemporary plays. At that time, in 69, there weren't too many contemporary black plays. There was, uh, they were all very old-fashioned. Uh, Theodore Ward, The Big White Fog. But I read whatever I could read. And then I picked up Frank Snowden's book about blacks and antiquity, and I read that. And then I read um, uh, the poems of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. I said, well, we could work on these. They're beautiful. And then I read Langston Hughes. I said, well, you know, I'll bring them in, and I'll see if we could work on Langston Hughes, because I like them, and they must know Langston Hughes, I figured. And so that's how I entered the classroom, thinking... Uh, I, I know enough about how to teach the theater, but I've got so much more to learn. And I went home every night, and as the book says, reading, researching, realizing. I did that for the first three years. Well, at the end of the first year, he said, thank you so much. Goodbye. And that's when I said on stage, I'm not leaving. I like it here. I'm learning. I'm learning a lot. I like it here. And between the work I was doing on myself and the work they were feeding me and I was figuring out, it was more than theater for me. It was baptism by fire and an education. So that's how, and I became over the years to realize that the big man, woman upstairs, had a hand in dropping me down there. Pick this up or don't, you know? She said, go down and see my husband, Bill Brown. And I did. And then I did my first show there, and I put her in as the lead. Wow. Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. Roxanne Reese was in that piece. Roxanne Reese, yes, indeed. And I put Alfred Dean in that. Yes, I called her up. And since she was the wife of the chair... He was thrilled. I didn't do it for that reason, but then I realized later, oh, that was good a political move. And so it all configured, you know. It, it starts to configure when you're on the right road and where you sh when you're doing what you should do, what you were born to do, what God wants you to do. It then all starts to shape in ways who could have known. You know, it... it, it Absolutely. I think it's all in divine order. You just mentioned Roxanne. I was going to mention Roxanne Reese. I interviewed Roxanne. She was my first interviewer for the podcast. And she's a wonderful actress. Wonderful. I met you. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how we met? No. I was trying to remember. I can hardly remember it's either. Been through Roxanne. It was through, you, you know, know what? what? It's a divine providence. Mm -hmm. Just all worked out. Well, you know, I always say this. I've been saying for years, God is a playwright. <laughs> Organized. Yes. And, you know, yes. beginning, middle, and end. And there's some sort of structure there that we don't know as we're going through it. We don't know it. Amazing. But at some point you get a glimpse of the structure, you know? You know, writes uh, that, that's you asked me how I felt about earlier about uh, that event and the love the student showed me. And that's what I was thinking. Who knew that this would come to pass? And look how God brought me through whatever the beginnings and and the um, the. Uh, difficulties and what the obstacles which you're supposed to jump over you're working hard yes. to do them so that's the thing we've got to do the work and then we'll be set along where we need to go well you have certainly accomplished a lifetime uh, lifelong um, mission 
with with what you've done and your accomplishments uh, greatly adored and adorned by our culture. Um, you've always been committed and devoted to preserving and nurturing, you know, our our the arts in the black community, and you've done a great service for black people. Well, they've done a great service for me too. It's been a wonderful collaboration, yeah, yeah, and I'm saying yeah. that so that we can introduce your beautiful book because you've oh, journaled you. it, you've chronicled, you've you've journaled this amazing story, this amazing love story in a book that's called A Cat's Walk. Let, a let's cat's talk walk. about it. And the subtitle is A Toolbox of Techniques for Actors and Directors. Do we have it? Put, pull it up yes, so people yes. can see it. And the, the first part of the book is a, a semi-memoir can I, can I hold of it my here? life at Howard. Okay. And I want to tell you what that means. You know, why I came to Howard, some of what I told you, and why I stayed, and what I learned, mistakes I made. I made many, Benita. Mistakes that were made about me. What, what I wanted to achieve while I was there. That's the first part of the book. The second part of the book is technique, technique, technique. Now, to my knowledge... And I don't think I did say that last night, the other night. To my knowledge, there is no other acting book, and there are many good ones, and there are many bad ones, but there are many acting books. To my knowledge, there's no book that uses as reference black material. Mm -hmm. We always hear a paragraph about Raisin in the Sun, period. Mm -hmm. And I, in the second half of the book, I use a lot of black material to show you how to apply the techniques. In the back of the book, I have a bibliography of black plays, and I say it's a beginning bibliography. Please add to it, because so much is happening since I've written the book. So many playwrights, like the advent of Dominique Marceau, who's written so many things. So uh, there are things that are missing in that part. Also, there's a glossary of terms used in the book, and also there is um, a list of active verbs, uh, which is very important to work with because verbs are what a character is fighting for uh, to get whatever. And the last thing in the book is a love note to my students. Oh. And that was written the other night. It was beautiful. Yes. Lynn read some of that. The other yes, night. that was on the last it page. Touched me so and then there's a deeply. memoriam page of all the wonderful people I've taught who were not with us. I need to, um, you know, really study it. uh, lots the, of pictures the forward by, by Fel Felicia Rashad. Uh, by Dean Felicia Rashad. Dean Felicia right, Rashad. Who I That's taught right. when she was Felicia yes. Allen, plain Felicia Allen, not a <laughs> dean, never plain, but not a dean. So, yes, um, she agreed to do that a long time ago for me. And I flipped the pages, and I, I just did a movie with Wendy Davis. Yes, I wanted to say ago. something about Wendy Raquel Robinson, who I also with Wendy Raquel Robinson. I taught her, and um, I'm very proud of her. People might know her from The Game. Yes. They probably saw her on that, and way back, the Steve Harvey Show. And she runs a marvelous theater company, in L.A. Um, called The Amazing Grace Conservatory. I did a fundraiser for, with her did for you? that. Did mm you? -hmm. Yes. She's wonderful. She's, She's wonderful. wonderful. And talent, as talented as she is, beautiful. So, yes, I Inside did want to say that. Um, she was supposed to come, but she was in the middle of doing a show with the kids mm -hmm. at the same time, you know? You know, that's what my manager said to me. This was cute. My manager said, you know, Vera, Oh, and when I said, well, who's going to be there? And I would ask her that, and she'd say, you know, Vera, all your students are working. And I'd say, okay, but who's going to be there? <laughs> and she'd say, they're working, Vera. And I finally got the subtext. And I said, oh, they're working, so they're not coming. And she said, yes. And I said, well, that's good. <laughs> because everybody's working. Yes, and, and it had just started to open up from yes. this nasty virus. Yeah, yeah. And so everybody was busy doing stuff. Yes, so. yes. So it's good that they're working. Better they should be working. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah.
We're very proud of you, Vera. I I am so proud to be a part of your great legacy. And I just want to say congratulations again on your eighth decade of your beautiful life. We're celebrating your birthday. Um, I want you to, so so I just, I also want to tell everybody, uh, don't forget that you can pre-order the book at, um, Vera J- VJ Cats. VJ Cats. You yes. can pre order the book, A Cat's Walk, at VJCats.com. And then that's the soft release that's happening now. And the hard release will be about June 10th on Amazon and all the other social media sites where you can purchase the book. And it's my hope that you use these techniques. And you apply them to your work so that your work will be better. Even if you're already working, there's some things in there that are not Stanislavski. They're pure Katzian. And I'd like you to dip into that, and it may even add to the, the, the good work you're already doing. Awesome. Awesome. Vera, is there anything that you'd like to leave with us? You can leave us anything, a, a, a thoughtful word. You can leave us your website, your cash app for donations. Your <laughs> You can leave us. Well, I guess if we're if we're going to turn this country into what we all know it could be, we have to look at each other. I guess I want white people to know and black people to know and all people to know that all the simple adage, don't judge a book by its cover. There is beauty in each one of our skin colors and in each one of our heritages, each one of our religious beliefs. There is beauty or they wouldn't exist. And I have to say to your people and to my people, We have to do better that way. We have to know that I can have white skin and still care. And you have your beautiful colored skin, color skin. I want to say that again. You can have your beautiful color skin and have so much to give inside of you. And we we both... We all have to recognize that, and that's what I'd like us to remember. I'd like us to do that. Um, There are limitations to being white, and I'd like white people to remember that. And um, I'd like us to respect each other and what we both have, what we all have. What we all have to offer each yes. other. And this great country. If we want it to be great, that's what we're down to now. That's what we're down to now. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful way to close the show. And um, I'm going to take the baton and, and, and spread some love the way you have expressed it to everyone that I meet. And so I'm grateful, Vera. Um, Thank you. Well, um, I'm grateful, too. Thank you. I enjoy this so much, Benita. I did. Thank you. Thank thank you, you Vera. For wanting to do it and putting me on your podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for for accepting. We are very excited to to air this, and and I'll give you all of the information. Later. Um, Yeah. So that's a perfect way to close out. This has been a Black History Mini Docs podcast with the fabulous Professor Vera J. Katz. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, And please look for more exciting episodes to come. Please subscribe to BHMD, hit like, share, and leave us your comments with whatever is on your mind. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Bonita Brisker. Take a break to create a very empowering moment in time. Be strong, be well, and be kind, as Vera said.
Now that you finished that, watch another. <laughs>